Play a room up front if you'd like. <laughs> okay. okay, well, I want to thank uh, the Eli Library and the Women's Club for inviting me and uh, hosting the event. Uh, this is my second opportunity of speaking here. Uh, the last time I spoke on the Angel of Hadley, and uh, someone had put uh, John Green's coffin nails on the desk. I don't know if you know who John Green was, but uh, some people b believe he may have been the regicide William Goff, and that's what the talk was about. So I don't have any coffin nails today uh, to serve as an uh, icebreaker. So what I did is I brought my war club, <laughs> my weapon of mass destruction, uh, but I don't use it as a headbreaker. I use it as an icebreaker to introduce the subject of King Philip's War. Uh, this is a replica of a club that supposedly belonged to King Philip. Uh, the uh, actual club is in the Fruitlands Museum in the town of Harvard. It has quite a colorful history. It was stolen many years ago from the museum and then 25 years later turned up at a flea market and has been restored. Uh, it's an authentic club from the period, from the it could very well have been used in King Philip's War, but there's no evidence that King Philip ever actually owned a war club. There's actually another war club that's been attributed to King Philip, which is, the, which is in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Western Reserve Historical Society Museum. Uh, and again, that's an authentic club from the period. Uh, so this type of club was still being used in warfare by Indians at that time. Uh, I do have an illustration that I'll pass out, I'll pass around, you can all take a look at it, uh, I'll start on this end. It shows um, the death of Philip, it shows Philip being shot. Uh, this occurred on August 12th, 1676, and in the background it shows uh, two individuals. One has just fired his musket and killed Philip, and the other one is standing next to him, and it shows Philip running, he had been running, and he had a war club, and his war club was flying through the air. And you'll see a lot of illustrations showing Philip with a war club, but there were no descriptions of him. And we have many contemporary descriptions of Philip because he was a prominent figure in uh, early 17, or in 17th century history, and there were many descriptions of him by uh, Englishmen who saw him, and there's never any description of him owning a gun. Uh, I'm sorry, a club. Uh, the uh, Indian who uh, has just fired the musket is an Indian named Alderman. He's the one that actually killed Philip. He was a Pocasset Indian. Uh, his brother had been killed by Philip in a fit of anger. And because of that, uh, Alderman deserted Philip's camp and betrayed his presence or his whereabouts to uh, Benjamin Church who uh, was the uh, military leader who actually was uh, hunted him down, and it was Alderman uh, serving under church who actually shot Philip. Uh, so just to introduce the subject of war, now, I, I always mention the fact that King Philip's war was the bloodiest war ever fought on American soil in terms of percentage of population killed. Now, obviously, the, in the Civil War, far more people were killed, but it was a much smaller percentage of the population died as a result of the war, of the Civil War. In the Civil War, roughly one half of one percent of the population died as a result of the war, a staggering number as we know. In King Philip's War, it was upwards of six, six and a half percent of the population actually died as a result of the war. So it was a very devastating war for both sides, for both the English and for the Indians. It took the economy of New England a full 100 years to recover from the war. The economy took that long before uh, the average household income in New England was equal to what it had been in, before King Philip's War. It wasn't until the American Revolution, actually. Uh, of the roughly 90 settlements in New England at that time, more than half were either totally destroyed or largely destroyed. For example, Springfield was destroyed, Providence was destroyed, uh, Brookfield, many, you can name town, Deerfield, town after town that was destroyed in the war. Not only were houses destroyed in barns, but also mills which were important to the economy. 
So it was a very devastating war. It was total war. It was war against all segments of the population. Both sides killed women and children. Uh, it was a war of, in a sense of annihilation, um, in intent at least, if not in actual fact. Uh, what I'd like to do is I want to ex explain my book, Women and King Philip's War, just briefly, uh, just to give you a feeling of what the book is about. And incidentally, I want to mention the fact that this book came about as a result of a talk I did to a women's club. Uh, the Sipican Women's Club in Marion, Massachusetts, uh, a number of years ago, asked me to do a, a talk on uh, King Philip's War for their, one of their monthly meetings. And I agreed to it, but then I had second thoughts, and I said, well, I realize that women serve in the military now, and in fact, I think a four-star general has just been appointed a very responsible position, a woman who's in the Air Force, I believe she is. Uh, but generally, I know from uh, past experience, when I give talks on King Philip's War, it's generally, it generally attracts more men than women, generally, not always. Uh, so I said, and I realized this is a captive audience. They're there for their monthly, these women are there for their monthly meeting. Um, how can I make this talk interesting to them? And I thought, well, gee, why don't I talk about the role of women in King Philip's War? Uh, my wife attended, my wife Yolanda attended the talk and thought that it went over well, and she persuaded me to do a book on it, which I did. And I'm glad I did, because the book's proved fairly popular, and I think it does serve a purpose. Uh, which I hope to talk about today. Uh, I, the book has three main sections. I've got a chronology and an introduction, a chronology of timeline of events, uh, especially events that uh, feature some of the women that I'll talk about. Uh, but by and large, I divided the book into three sections. The first section I devote to the three squaw sachems who were prominent in King Philip's War. These were the three uh, so-called squaw sachems, they were women sachems, who were leaders of their tribes who fought on the side of Philip. Uh, Wiedemo is probably known to most people, or many people are familiar with Wiedemo. Wiedemo was the uh, squaw sachem of the Pocasset Indians. Uh, her tribe was located around uh, Fall River in uh, Tiverton, Rhode Island. That was the area of the Pocassets. Uh, another prominent uh, squaw sachem was Awashonks. She uh, was squaw sachem of the Sakonnet Indians. They were around the area of Little Compton, Rhode Island. And then finally, uh, the other major squaw sachem was a woman named Queerpin. She was uh, a Narragansett. The Narragansetts had six primary sachems, and she was one of the primary sachems of the Narragansetts. She was located around what's now Exeter, or uh, North Kingstown, South Kingstown, Rhode Island. Incidentally, I'll talk a little bit about all of these if, as time allows. One of the problems I have in doing a talk on King Philip's War, and especially women in King Philip's War, is there's just not enough time to give justice to all of these remarkable women. Uh, but Queer, Queerpin, even though she was a sachem of the Narragansetts, was not herself a Narragansett. She was an Eastern Niantic. Uh, and I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll talk about that a little bit more. That's the first section of the book. The second section I devote entirely to Mary Rowlandson. Uh, Mary Rowlandson, as you may know, was the English woman who was captured uh, along with her three children in a raid on Lancaster on February 10th, 1676. Uh, she was in captivity for 11 and a half weeks, uh, suffered greatly, uh, had to be on the uh, move constantly, and fortunately lived to write about her ordeal. She, in fact, wrote a book that was published in 1682, and it became the first best-selling book in America. So we can say that the first best-selling book in America was written by a woman, uh, Mary Rowlandson. It was published in Boston in 1682, uh, published twice again in Cambridge of that year, and also published in London in that year. And it's been essentially in print ever since. Um, you can readily obtain a copy, uh, certainly a used copy. Most libraries have a copy. I, have, I own three copies of the book. No, I don't have the original, unfortunately. They're all reprints. Uh, but it's, it's a remarkable book, well worth reading. It's a fascinating book, as you can imagine. And I'll try to talk about that a little bit when I, uh, if I have time, hopefully, to get to Mary Rowlandson. Uh, 
Uh, she also, in writing that book, created a new subgenre of American literature, the captivity narrative, uh, because her book about her captivity by, uh, by Indians was so popular that future captors of Indians who survived the ordeal wrote books, and many of them became best-selling ones, like the, um, the redeemed captive, for example, uh, William's account of his uh, captivity uh, from the Deerfield Raid of 1704. And then the th third section of the book is a miscellany. I have a number of chapters, some of them devoted to individual women, uh, both English and Indian. For example, I have a, a and they're very brief chapters because we don't know a lot about some of these people. For example, I have a, a brief chapter on Amy, who was Philip's sister. Uh, she was married to uh, the so-called Black Sachem Tispaquin. He was called the Black Sachem because he was not only a Sachem, but he was also a powwow, a medicine man. Uh, and uh, I have a, a brief account of her. I have another one on Wuta Kanuski, who was uh, Philip's wife. Also, I have a chapter on Penelope Winslow, and I'd like to talk about her a little bit primarily to contrast her with some of the other women that I talk about. Penelope Winslow was the wife of, the, of Josiah Winslow, who was the governor of Plymouth Colony at the time. I also have a few chapters on more general topics like the, what life was like for women, in, not only in the uh, 17th century New England, but certainly on the frontier and the hardships that they faced under normal times uh, we, never mind doing warfare. Uh, and finally, I, and I hope I get to this, I never get to it, but I hope I get to it, I have a chapter on the women of Marblehead, uh, which is probably one of my, <laughs> I, I like grotesque things and gruesome things, and this is one of my favorite chapters, and I hope I have time for it. Uh, so just to give you a, a, a brief uh, perspective of what my book's all about, I realize when I do these talks that not everyone has a full picture of King Philip's War, so I always try to do uh, a brief overview, and I'll try to keep it brief, because as you can see, I've, not all of these are books are about King Philip's War, but I've, I've written a number of books about King Philip's War. I find this subject endlessly fascinating. I, it did change the course of American history, uh, and I'll maybe mention some of the ways it did this as I talk. Uh, and it's, of course, very important to this area, but not only to uh, New England, but also to the rest of the country, too, because it set a pattern for the way that Indians would be treated and the way that uh, we would advance. Uh, and it's kind of, uh, I think, probably obvious now, looking back, how we treated the Indians, but it wasn't obvious prior to King Philip's War. There was that possibility that the two cultures English and Indian might have merged. There was always that possibility. It was happening to some degree with the Christian Indians. Uh, many Indians had converted to Christianity. Uh, there were 13 so-called praying Indian villages in Massachusetts alone at the time. There were others in Plymouth Colony and there were others in Connecticut. And these praying Indian villages, the Indians who had converted to Christianity, no longer lived like Indians, they lived like Englishmen. They lived in houses, they uh, dressed like Englishmen, they worshiped like Englishmen. And there was that possibility that the two cultures might have merged, but that was all destroyed in King Philip's War. What time period are we talking about? 1675, 1677, roughly. Uh, the war in southern New England ended in 1677. Six, but it lasted another full year in northern New England. In fact, it really, in one sense, never really ended. There was an uneasy truce in 1677 in northern New England, but the future wars between the French and the Indians, the so-called French and Indian Wars, uh, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, Queen George's War, and then the, the French and Indian War, those can be attributed in large part to King Philip's War because uh, at the close of King Philip's War, uh, many Indians had been killed, many thousands had been enslaved, sent into foreign slavery. Uh, many had, were executed by the English, but many had fled the area. Some fled to New York, uh, 
Uh, we, we know that some made it as far as the Midwest. Of course, many of them perished along the way. They were killed by hostile Indians, but many of them survived. But many of them went into northern New England and uh, lived with the, uh, became uh, Abenakis, lived with the Abenaki Indians. And many of them went into Canada. Many of them fled to Canada. And it was them and oh, it was they and their descendants who had this animosity and this bitter memory of what had happened to them in New England that uh, caused them to side with the French in these future wars. So in a sense, uh, Jill Lepore, who is a Harvard uh, professor, and she also writes for the New Yorker magazine, uh, she wrote a, what I think is a, a fabulous book on King Philip's War called The Name of War. And she says in one sense, King Philip's War never ended, and, and, that, and that's true. So it was an extremely bloody war. It began in Plymouth Colony, where I live. I live in Middleborough. Uh, so uh, it began in Swansea, which uh, was adjacent. And Swansea was a much bigger... When I talk about towns in, in this, we're usually talking about areas that are much bigger than the current towns now. Uh, f Swansea, for example, was really... At, well, there was Swansea, but there was, it encompassed what's now Warren, Rhode Island, Bristol, Rhode Island... Uh, what was adjacent to it, Barrington, those areas. Uh, if you mention Rehoboth, you're, you're actually talking about East Providence and, and other areas. Uh, so there was a, a, the, a recent settlement of English in Swansea, which was a, adjacent to where Philip had his headquarters in, on Mount Hope, in what's now Bristol, Rhode Island. So it makes sense that if a war was going to break out, it would break out where the two... Uh, civilizations were the closest, and that's indeed what happened. Um, I won't go into all the causes of the war except to say that trouble had been fermenting for many years, and it was largely a result of the English greed for land. The English kept on taking land one way or the other from the Indians. They might have thought they were doing it legally, but that's questionable. And also because the Indians felt that their culture was being destroyed. As I said, many thousands of Indians were converting to Christianity. And the Indians who were not converting saw this as a threat to their way of life. Their whole way of life was being destroyed. And there were other causes, too, which I, I don't have time to go into. But it, it had been fomenting for quite a while. And finally, in June of 1675, war did break out. The first attack by the Indians was made on Swansea. And from there, the war spread out very rapidly. Plymouth Colony, uh, even before the first day of the war, June 24th, even prior to that, they knew that they were facing problems, and they had sent for help uh, to Massachusetts Bay Colony and also to Connecticut. And both of those colonies uh, sent soldiers in immediately uh, into the Swansea area. Massachusetts actually sent not only uh, English soldiers, but they also sent a company of uh, Christian Indians to fight on the side of the uh, English. Connecticut sent not only English soldiers, but also there was a small uh, army of, of about 50 Mohegan Indians. The Mohegans fought on the side of the English throughout the war and uh, helped win the war a great deal because uh, eventually, there were like maybe 250 uh, Mohegans at any one time, which doesn't sound like a great number, but the population at that time wasn't that great either. Uh, we don't know the exact population. We, the estimates are roughly 50 to 55,000 English living in New England at that time, and perhaps 25 or 30,000 Indians living in New England at that time. So. Uh, uh, even a uh, hundred men would be a significant fighting force at that time because in terms of the total population. After Swansea, the war quickly spread. The Indians attacked where I live, Middleborough, destroyed Middleborough in July. They attacked Old Dartmouth, which encompasses not only current Dartmouth but also Fairhaven and New Bedford. The three settlements there were destroyed. On July 14th, Nipmucks attacked Menden, it was a small settlement, uh, which brought the war into Massachusetts. Prior to that, the, the fighting had been in Plymouth Colony between the English and the Wampanoags. Philip was sachem of the Wampanoags. Uh, 
But on July 14th, the English realized, well, now they had a greater problem on their hand because now the Nipmucks are attacking. And from there, it quickly spread into central Massachusetts uh, to the Connecticut River Valley. The Connecticut River Valley saw some of the heaviest fighting. Uh, Deerfield was destroyed. Northfield, Brookfield, Hadley was attacked, Hatfield was attacked. You had all of these, this, the, the various river tribes were coming in now, the Pocumtucks, the Agawams. Uh, all the tribes were rising up against the English. On September 5th in uh, Maine, the Abenakis made their first attack. So here's another major group of Indians. The Abenakis um, encompassed a lot of other tribes like the uh, uh, Penobscots, the Passamacarties, and the uh, Androscogans, they're all Abenakis. They rose up and started f attacking the English settlements. Uh, so you can see that you had this wide conflagration that took place, it was taking place all over New England. It wasn't just confined to one local area, which the English had originally thought it would. And finally, the um, Narragansetts, who were the largest tribe at that time and the most powerful tribe in New England had remained neutral uh, so far. Now we'd not, we'll never know whether they re would have remained neutral throughout the war or not. There are indications that they, they might have, there are indications that they may not have. But in any case, the English did not trust them and also incidentally wanted their land because uh, the, the area around what's now Narragansett, uh, Rhode Island, and that whole area is this beautiful farmland, which is much better than anything in Massachusetts, really. Uh, the English had, had long coveted this land. So uh, partly as an excuse to seize this land and partly because they didn't trust the Narragansetts, the uh, English uh, raised an army among the three colonies, and it was the largest army ever formed in New England until that time. It was over a thousand Englishmen and about 150 Indians uh, under the leadership of Josiah Winslow, who was governor of Plymouth Colony. But there were troops from Connecticut and troops from uh, Massachusetts as well. They all joined forces and they invaded Rhode Island. They did not ask the permission of Rhode Island to invade. They just notified Rhode Island that they were coming in and they asked for help from Rhode Island, uh, but they didn't ask permission. They just invaded Rhode Island because the Narragansetts had their fortress in a, a swamp in, uh, in uh, Rhode Island near South Kingstown. I don't want to belabor this too much. I want to get to the women, but I do want to mention this because this is the greatest battle ever fought on New England soil. The Narragansetts had constructed this great fortress in the middle of the swamp thinking that they were safe because the armies would not be able to cross the swamp. However, it was a very severe winter that year. In fact, the whole 17th century was a, a, an extra cold winter in New England. It was a, like a mini ice age. Uh, so by December 19th, which is the day that the English were actually able to attack the fort, the swamp had frozen over. The English were able to locate the, the swamp because of uh, an Indian that they captured and somehow compelled the uh, cajole to tell them where the fortress was. So they, they were able to attack the uh, fortress where the Narragansetts were hold, held out. And a very extremely bloody battle ensued in which many English were killed, but many more Indians were killed. And uh, the English deliberately set fire to the wigwams inside the fortress, which were harboring many women and children and uh, older men. Uh, in fact, the Narragansetts had taken in a lot of uh, women and children of the Wampanoags uh, just to give them refuge during the war. And uh, hundreds of these were burnt to death, burned alive, and many others were massacred. Uh, as they tried to escape. So it was an extremely bloody battle. The English did suffer, but not as much as the Indians. The Narragansetts, many of them were able to escape, many of the warriors. So the Narragansetts were now heavily involved in the war likewise. And much of Rhode Island was, was, was destroyed as a result of the war. By the end of the war, the only um, community still standing uh, in Rhode Island was roughly New, Newport. I mean, there, Providence was destroyed. Roger Williams uh, came out to confront the Indians, but uh, even his house was burned. Uh, so he had much of New England was being destroyed at this time. 
the uh, war went against the English for much of the war. The Indians were winning the war until spring of the next, the following year. And that's the last thing I'll mention about the war before I get on to the women. I just want to say that it was the Battle of Sudbury that was the turning point, or was considered the turning point in the war. Up until Sudbury, which uh, the attack was on April 21st of 1676, the Indians had been winning. They actually won the Battle of Sudbury. They actually were winners there. But um, they didn't achieve their goal, which was to seize enough food and uh, ammunition so that they could go on and attack Boston. Uh, they failed in that. Uh, Mary Rowlandson, who was a captive at that time, describes them coming back to her camp where she was held prisoner. And they, even though they had won the war, they were very demoralized. They sensed that the tide had turned against them. And so it had. After that, the English began winning uh, many victories. Benjamin Church uh, was able to persuade Plymouth Colony to allow him to raise an army that was largely Indians, uh, Indians who, whom he had either captured or he had befriended. Uh, and he went after, and he's the one that was act, able to hunt down Philip and uh, do another other things to end the war in southern New England. Uh, so any questions on that aspect? It's a very quick overview of King Philip's War. <laughs> uh, and there's much more, and I didn't go into much detail, but I just want to give a, a view of what was going on. Um, okay, uh, the women, I, I, I talked about, I'd, I'd like to begin with Wiedemo. As I said, she's probably the woman uh, that, well, the Squaw Sachem is certainly, that most people are familiar with for a number of reasons. Uh, and I, I want to emphasize that all three of these women were remarkable because, don't forget, they were all Sachems. And even though uh, the Indians allowed women to have a great deal of authority, it wasn't that common for, them to, for there to be women sachems. There were women sachems, we know of others, among the various tribes. Uh, but for a woman to be a sachem meant that she had great leadership abilities. Uh, Wiedemo certainly did. Uh, she was Philip's sister-in-law, uh, and doubly so, because she had been married to his brother Alexander, and he was married to her younger sister, Uta Kanuski. So uh, she was his uh, sister-in-law in a double sense of the word. She is also uh, important in my estimation, or one of the reasons I want to talk about her, is that she had a close relationship with Mary Rowlandson. It wasn't a pleasant relationship for Mary, but uh, Uta Kanuski... Uh, owned Mary w during her captivity. Mary Rowlandson was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Wiedemo, was Wiedemo's, Wiedemo's uh, slave during uh, her captivity. And Wiedemo also had met uh, Penelope Winslow, Josiah Winslow, the governor's wife. So she's, we see this, she's sort of in the middle of the spectrum. In 1662, uh, Massa Soyet had either died or had retired. It's believed that he retired and moved into Nipmuc country. And his older son, Alexander, took over the leadership of the Wampanoags. Massa Soyet was the great sachem of the uh, Wampanoags, and his oldest son, Alexander, succeeded him after he retired. The English at that time, even as early as 1662, were not trusting the Indians. They, and they had good cause not to trust the Indians because of the way they had been treating them. <laughs> uh, and if you look at the history, they hadn't been treating the Indians very well, and the Indians had reason to be restless and unhappy. Uh, they believed that the Indians, uh, Alexander among them, were plotting against the English, so they summoned uh, the leaders, the Indian leaders, to come to Plymouth. Uh, they sent a messenger to Alexander. He said he had come, but he didn't show up. So Governor Prince of Plymouth Colony sent Josiah Winslow, who was not governor at that time in 1662, but he had succeeded uh, the position that Miles Standish had held. He was chief military officer of Plymouth Colony. Uh, he sent, Governor Prince sent Winslow to bring uh, Alexander in forcibly if necessary. Uh, without going into a great detail, uh, Winslow came upon 
Alexander at a, a fishing and hunting camp in uh, what's now Halifax, uh, Massachusetts, uh, at uh, Lake, uh, Lake Montponset. And the Indians, uh, uh, Alexander was there with a group of his people, uh, men and women. In fact, we know that Wiedemo was there, his wife at the time was there. And they were inside this uh, lodge eating breakfast, and they had unwisely stacked their guns outside. The English came along, seized the guns, and then forcibly brought Alexander back to Duxbury to uh, be questioned. Now, it was a very hot July day, and it's perhaps because of the ordeal that Alexander went through or his great rage at being treated this, because you have to recall that he considered himself a sovereign leader. He was the leader of the Wampanoags. He was not subservient to the English, but they were treating him as if he were. Uh, whatever the case is, or he may have just became ill, he became gravely ill. Uh, he was brought to Marshfield to Winslow's home, Careswell, uh, and uh, it's at that time that it's, I believe that Penelope must have met uh, Wiedemo because Wiedemo was in the group, and they were called guests at, at Careswell. Uh, I'm a, I imagine they may have camped outside, I don't know, but I feel, feel that Penelope probably at that time did uh, meet uh, Wiedemo. But in any case, Alexander fell gravely ill, and uh, he was allowed to return to Mount Hope in uh, Rhode Island, but unfortunately, what was part of Plymouth Colony at the time, unfortunately he fell ill and died. Now the Indians, his brother Philip and his wife Wiedemo, believed that he had been deliberately poisoned by the English. We don't know if that's true, but another point of animosity, another reason why the Indians were beginning to really hate the English was this belief that they had killed their leader, Alexander. When Alexander died, Philip took over. He now became the leader of the Wampanoags. Uh, Wiedemo, we know, was married uh, five times. In fact, it's ironic that her name in Algonquin means sweetheart. <laughs> uh, whether she had a sweetheart or not is, uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but her, evidently her first husband died. Uh, she married uh, Alexander. We know that he died and how he died. Uh, she had a third husband. Uh, we don't know anything about him, really. Her four, fourth husband was a man named Peter Nunnewit, and she was married to Peter Nunnewit at the time that King Philip's War broke out. He sided with the English. She went with her brother-in-law, Philip. She was a Pocasset. She had roughly 300 warriors, which was a sizable number of warriors for that time. So she brought her 300 warriors into Philip's camp uh, at that time. So she essentially divorced Peter. She married, a, as her fifth husband, a Narragansett sachem named Quinnipin. And you've got to be careful here because we have a female sachem named Quiapin, and we have a male sachem named Quinnipin. They're both Narragansett sachems. Uh, she was actually his third wife. He had two other wives at the time, but uh, some of the Indians married had more than one wife. Uh, and I mention this because on the raid on Lancaster on February 10th of, 17, uh, of 1676, the Indian who captured Mary Rowlandson sold her to Quinnipin and Wiedemo, and that's when Mary Rowlandson became their slave for the duration of her captivity. Uh, any questions on Wiedemo? Uh, she had, like most of the Indians at the end of the war, a sad ending. Uh, she was being pursued at the end of the war in uh, August and uh, managed to escape somehow. Uh, a number of soldiers were pursuing her. But a few days later, her body was found in the Taunton River. This was on August 6th. So she had evidently drowned while attempting to escape. So the English cut off her head and brought it to Taunton and set it on a pole. That's the end of Wiedemo, unfortunately. Um, I just want to mention Washonks briefly. She was squaw sachem of the uh, Sakonets. Uh, 
We, we know a great deal about her because of her friendship and her association with Benjamin Church. Uh, Benjamin Church was the, uh, the greatest of the military leaders among the English. Uh, he's credited with being the forerunner of the special forces, the Rangers and the, the Green Berets, and all those special forces uh, trace their history, at least uh, thematically or, or spiritually, back to uh, Benjamin Church. Because the English at that time were f trying to fight Indians European style, the way Europeans fought. And it was Benjamin Church who realized you have to fight Indians the way they fight, which is a guerrilla warfare. And he actually, as I said, used um, a lot of Indians in his army. Uh, and he ra well, most of his army consisted of Indians that he had either captured and, or he had befriended. So he, he, at the uh, 40 years after the war, it's a long time, 40 years after the war, Benjamin Church wrote a book about the war. And he writes quite a bit about a war shock. So we know a, a, a deal about her from uh, Benjamin Church's book. He uh, initially, in June of 1675, before the war actually started, but when it was obvious that trouble was brewing, Benjamin Church had met up with her, uh, risking his life doing so, and had tried to persuade her to side with the English. She agreed to side with the English, but she wanted assurances from Plymouth that she would be okay. Uh, Church was unable to uh, return to her with that assurance because the war broke out and it became too dangerous. So she actually joined forces with Philip, and like uh, her counterpart, Wiedemo, she also had about 300 warriors that she was responsible for. So they joined uh, forces with Philip. However, a year later, Church was able to meet up with her again, again at great risk to his uh, own safety, and he persuaded her to surrender, which she did. So she was the only one of the squaw sachems who survived the war because she did surrender. Uh, and it, it, had she not surrendered, she probably would have been killed too. Uh, but again, uh, like most of the Indians of this period, she came to a sad ending. And I say this because we don't know when she died. Um, the English, unfortunately, did not keep a lot of records about Indians. The only time they wrote about Indians was when they were concerned that they might be a danger to them. They seldom wrote about the Indians for any other reason. So we really don't know what, how long Awashanks lived or when she died. We do know that she was still alive in 1683. And the reason we know this is because she, her son Peter, and her daughter Betty were arrested by the English and put on charges of, uh, and put on trial on charges of infanticide. Uh, the, her daughter Betty had given birth to a child out of wedlock. Now, that's perfect Indian custom. It was, that was perfectly legitimate among the Indians. But the Puritans, you know, couldn't do that. They were Puritans. Uh, and this was a crime in the Puritan society. And it shows you how the English were now totally dominating the Indians. They had completely taken control of Indian society, and Indians were now living under English law. Uh, Betty had given birth to the child. The child had died, and she and her mother and her brother buried the child. Well, for the English, in the English view, if you buried an illegitimate child and didn't mention it, it's because you killed it, so you're guilty of infanticide. Uh, fortunately, they were able to, they were acquitted on charges of infanticide, uh, but uh, Betty was found guilty of fornication. Uh, but the point here is that they were totally subservient at this time to the uh, English, and that's the last we hear about Washongs. Uh, what happened to her after that, we have no idea. Um, any questions on that? Yes? Where did this trial take place? Um, it would have taken place probably in Plymouth, I would imagine, because it, would be, it was Plymouth Colony at that time. Okay. So uh, I imagine it would have been in Plymouth. Okay. Right. Uh, Plymouth Colony, Plymouth was the smallest of the colonies. Uh, didn't have a lot of courts and stuff. Um, I, well, I didn't mention, uh, one thing I wanted to mention on um, Wiedemo was that she was the daughter of Corbettant. Uh, and uh, if, if that name's not familiar to you, he was one of the sachems who was alive when the pilgrims uh, established their settlement in Plymouth in 1620. 
And he uh, was, unlike Massasoit, who befriended the English, Corbett really wanted to destroy the English. And it turns out, the history turns out that he was right in wanting to do this. He, you know, had he, been, he wanted to just annihilate the uh, colony, of the Plymouth colony, and, because he felt that the English would be a danger. Uh, so it's ironic that you know, he, he was right and his daughter suffered because of uh, the fact that he wasn't able to accomplish what he wanted to do. Uh, and then just a few words on Quiapin, uh, as time allows. Quiapin, as I said, was uh, uh, an eastern Ni- Niantic. The um, Niantics are an interesting group of Indians. Um, sometime before Europeans came to the New World, we don't know if it was 120 years uh, before the European came to the New World, but for some reason, the Niantics split. Um, the Eastern Niantics allied themselves with the Narragansetts, and the Western Niantics allied themselves with the Pequots. And the <clears throat> Narragansetts and Pequots were bitter enemies. So we don't know what... The, I'm not going to go into the history of the Niantics. I just thought I'd mention that as an interest. And when we say Eastern Niantics and Western Niantics, even though they're Niantics, they're now separate groups. Um, in fact, her brother was... Um, Indian named Ninigret, who features throughout uh, colonial history. He was born in 1600. He played an important role in the Pequot War of 1637, and he was still alive and played a role in uh, King Philip's War in 1675. Uh, The Niantics were one of the few tribes that were able to remain neutral until towards the end the Niantics did join the side of the English. So towards the end of the war, the Niantics were fighting on the side of the English. Uh, So here you have brother against sister because um, Quiapin was fighting on the side of, of course, the Indians. She she, uh, had married a Narragansett sachem named Mixano. He was the son of Canonicus. Canonicus was the great sachem uh, of the Narragansetts when the pilgrims landed. Uh, he's famous for having sent a, a snake skin full of arrows to the pilgrims. Are you aware of that? Any of that? Uh, I've got a good account of it in my latest book, uh, Soans in Polkadot at Massasoit's Town. Um, but it was a, the, the, the English, the pilgrims didn't know what this meant, this snake skin full of um, arrows in the Tisquantum, or Squanto as we know them, explained, well, it's a challenge, it's a war challenge. What the English did, what Bradford, Governor Bradford did, was uh, he filled the snakeskin with uh, uh, bullets and powder and sent it back, telling the Narragansetts, we're, we're not afraid of you, and that kind of eased over that situation. But um, she married a son of Canonicus, so he died in 1657, and she became sachem of uh, that group. There were six groups of Narragansetts. And I, again, I want to emphasize that she had to have been a capable leader because it was not customary for the wife of a sachem necessarily to take over his position. Often his eldest son would. It wasn't hereditary in the sense that the, the monarch, monarchies in Europe were hereditary. In Europe, you had the strict line of uh, descent or, 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 or accession from, from the monarchy. If, you you knew who was going to be the next king or queen as soon as the current reigning one died. Not so among the um, Algonquin Indians. Among the Algonquins, uh, and of course all the the New England Indians were uh, Algonquins, um, the sachem was really uh, not, I won't say elected, but was chosen by the people. Generally, it would be a son one of the sons of the sachem, or maybe a nephew of the sachem, but not necessarily. And you weren't sachem for life either. If you displeased your people, they would get rid of you. They might kill you if you, they felt you had transgressed against them, or they might just boot you out and choose another sachem. So for the fact that they um, chose Quiapin to be their sachem shows that she was a very capable leader. She was elderly. I told, her, told you, her, we don't know when she was born, but her brother was born in 1600. Uh, even if she was a much younger sister, she was, st- and she, well, we know that her husband died in 1657. So in 1675, she was quite elderly. She was known as the Old Queen. Well, that was one of the titles that the English gave her, the Old Queen. 
Uh, she had a fortress in Exodus. It was hidden. The English didn't know where it was. But it's still, the, the remains of it are still there in Exodus. You can, I, I haven't been there, uh, but you can visit the remains, I believe. I, I, I'm assuming it's still on public land, I don't know. Uh, but it was partly a natural formation of rocks uh, that had been fortified. And the man who fortified it was a man named Stonewall John who was a remarkable figure. He had lived among the English and had learned masonry. Uh, He's also credited, so he um, helped build, he he essentially designed the building of this fortress. He also designed the Narragansett Fortress too, which wasn't made of stone entirely, but uh, he designed that too. So he was a remarkable figure, and he figures in other incidents in King Philip's War, which we don't have time for. uh, we don't know where Queerpin spent her time during the war, uh, but we do know what happened to her, like all the other Indians at the end of the war. Uh, I didn't emphasize this, but by the late spring of 1676, I mentioned Sudbury, and that was the turning point. The Indians were demoralized. Uh, they had been outnumbered from the beginning. They had lost a lot of warriors. They were out of ammunition because they were using muskets and they were out of ammunition uh, and they were out of food. They were starving and then they'd had, they had been starving for quite a while. So they were demoralized and the whole coalition fell apart at that time and they were being ruthlessly hunted down by the English and there were a lot of massacres and one of them occurred, it, it's what what's now Smithfield, Rhode Island on July 2nd of 1676. Queerpin, and we don't know how many, maybe 200, maybe 300 of her followers, they attempted to surrender. Uh, Major Talcott of Connecticut had been ruthlessly hunting down Indians throughout Connecticut. Now, I mean, I'm sorry, throughout Rhode Island. He was from Connecticut, but he was hunting Indians down uh, in uh, Rhode Island. And the Queerpin and her, folk, her people attempted to surrender. Uh, to the English, but instead they were massacred. Uh, roughly maybe 175 were killed. Now the English suffered no, and they were Indian allies, they, they had their Mohegan, Pequot, and Niantic allies with them. They suffered no casualties except for one Indian who it's believed was w- uh, wounded by friendly fire by his own people. So it shows you that the Indians had not put up a fight. They were, they were attempting to surrender. Queerpin was killed, and also Stonewall John was killed in that, that massacre. So that was the end of her. Uh, not a cheerful subject. <laughs> you can see why when uh, the Simacan Women's Club asked me to do a talk, I was a little apprehensive. I said, you know, it's not the most cheerful uh, subject. Uh, but it is a fascinating subject, and it's a story that has to be told, I think. Uh, the way the English uh, treated the Indians has to be told. I just want to mention before I go on to Mary Rowlandson that at the end of the war, Many hundreds of Indians were executed. They weren't treated as war prisoners. They were treated as um, t- uh, people who had committed treason against the King of England. They were hanged. They were shot. Boston Commons was a killing ground. New- many Indians were in- uh, executed in Newport and other areas. And many thousands were sold into slavery. Uh, the lucky ones were sold into domestic slavery, but most of them were sold outside of uh, New England, uh, outside of uh, North America, well, the continent. Uh, Most of them were sent to the West Indies, but the West Indian plantation owners did not want Indians as slaves. They didn't, first of all, they didn't want any skilled warriors who knew how to fight as slaves. And Indians didn't make good slaves. They they refused to be uh, subservient. They didn't make good slaves at all. So they were sent to other parts of the world. Uh, we know that some ended up in Spain. We know that some, some ended up in Morocco. Uh, and some ended up in the Azores. Uh, there were people in the Azores that claimed to be <laughs> descendants of uh, New England Indians. Uh, so a very tragic story. Not many of them. Some of them tried to return. Not many of them made it. And many, many um, hundreds fled New England uh, some made it as far as I, was, I mentioned earlier, some made it as far as the Midwest. You know, we're not talking about great numbers here. New York is interesting. I wish I had more time to talk about New York's role in the war. Uh, 
uh, the governor of New York, Governor Andrews, uh, offered sanctuary to anyone uh, who wanted it, whether they were Indian, English, Dutch, French. He offered sanctuary in New York, and many hundreds of Indians fled and accepted sanctuary in New York. Um, and the English, the, the uh, New England in English was so vindictive that they tried to um, convince Andros to turn these Indians over to them, but he refused. Uh, but the English were, I, were really angry, and, and, and they pursued, as the Indians fled towards uh, New York, they were hunted down and killed. In fact, some were killed in Great Barrington. There was a battle in Great Barrington. It was really a massacre of Indians attempting to flee into New York. And as I said, many of them went to Canada, and many, many of them went into northern New England. So that was really the ending of, of, of the uh, Indians. That was the way the Indians were treated. And I say, it's, I, you know, as I say, it's a story that has to be told. We can't look back on uh, Puritan ancestors and say, well, well, what wonderful people they were. They weren't. Uh, you know, they may have, there are extenuating circumstances. You can see things from their point of view, but they committed a lot of atrocities. Right now, I'll just mention this very briefly, I'm writing a book about the Pequot War. And uh, that was just an out-and-out -out deliberate attempt, and really they succeeded in exterminating the Pequots. The English set out to exterminate the Pequots, which were the most powerful tribe in New England, uh, southern New England at that time, and they succeeded. Uh, <clears throat> that's another matter. So we'll turn to Mary Rowlandson, uh, if that's okay. If anyone has any questions, I, yes. Uh, you mentioned the Squaw Sachems. Squaw right. A typical role of a satyr? <clears throat> well, a satyr is what we would call the chief of the tribe, the leader. Um, he or she would, was not an absolute uh, ruler. Now, they did have power. They could uh, condemn someone to death, for example, or they could uh, initiate a war, but they usually did it uh, with a council. They had their advisors, and it was usually consensus. I mean, generally, the council would probably do what the satyr wanted. But if the sachem went contrary to everyone in the council or the majority, then uh, he, he or she would either be persuaded to act otherwise or, or might be booted out. So they had power. Um, they, they could declare war on other groups. They could uh, condemn some to death. They would settle disputes within the tribe. If there was a, a dispute between two families or, say, or two groups, they could allot hunting grounds so that... Uh, family wanted a, the rights to hunt in a certain area, they could grant that, or farm. Because the Indians didn't own land privately, they owned it collectively. So that uh, if a family wanted to farm a certain area, and we have to remember that the Indians did cultivate quite extensi extensively, uh, that you know, he, could allot, he or she could allot the right to um, do this. So they were leaders, they were leaders. Not absolute leaders, but fairly uh, powerful leaders. Uh, and especially someone like um, Massasoit, and then his son Alexander, and then followed by his other son Philip, they were the grand sachems. The Wampanoags were a coalition. Uh, they, Massasoit and his sons, were actually Pocanawkets. And then you had—I mentioned the Pocassets and the Sacanets. There were many other groups of Indi uh, Indians, the Namaskets, and there were the Cape Cod Indians. All the Indians on Cape Cod, but they were all part of that Wampanoag coalition under the general leadership of Massasoit. There would be lesser sachems and Sagamores under that. But each sage of a Sagamore would be responsible for his or her own smaller group. But they, they would be tributary to the uh, larger, uh, the greater sage. And a lot of these were coalitions through marriage. Some of them were through conquest. Sometimes a weaker tribe would seek out the help of a greater tribe. And, and, and there were changes being made all the time. For example, uh, at some period, a, a tribe might be affiliated with the Nipmucks, but for whatever reason, they might become affiliated with the Mohegans if they were living in that border area, or maybe within the Narragansetts, whichever worked out and whatever was going on at the time. So you didn't have any firm boundaries here either. Okay, a little time to talk about Mary Rowlandson. Uh, she was married to the minister of Lancaster, the minister, of course, was the most prominent member of the community, so she was pretty prominent in her community. Uh, and uh, as I said, she had to be a remarkable woman herself to have written a book. We have to remember that in 17th century New England, uh, Puritans, fortunately for us, uh, believed in education for all children. Uh, I say fortunately for us because 
our education system is really based on that whole belief that all children should attend school. Uh, however, generally, although girls were taught to read, they generally weren't taught to write. Boys were taught to read and write. Girls were taught to read. Uh, and the reason the Puritans did this is because they felt that each individual should read and interpret the Bible on his or her own. Uh, that's why they were Puritans. They were trying to purify themselves from the Church of England. They did not believe in bishops and priests and anyone t or saints or anyone telling you what to do. Uh, they had a minister that you would listen to, but you were supposed to interpret the Bible on your own. So, but Mary uh, obviously could write. She knew how to write because she wrote a book. In uh, 1676, she was living in Lancaster, which had become a frontier town. I mean, it had always been somewhat of a frontier town, but you have to remember that all these other towns, like in the uh, Connecticut River Valley, had been destroyed. And totally, like Brookfield was totally abandoned. Uh, Northfield was totally abandoned. All these towns were abandoned, and the, the frontier was moving inward all the time. So Lancaster was exposed. Now, ironically, her husband and her brother-in-law and a few other prominent leaders of Lancaster went to Boston to get help. You know, they wanted troops stationed in Lancaster. Well, while they were gone, the Indians attacked on February 10th. There were six garrison houses in uh, Lancaster. The garrison house simply meant it was a house that was stronger than the others. It might have deliberately have been made stronger or it might just be the strongest house in the area. But there were six garrison houses where everyone would take refuge if there was an attack. The Rowlandson garrison was the only one of the six that actually uh, fell during the attack. The other five managed to hold out until help came. In the Rowlandson garrison, there were 37 people. Only one managed to escape. The others were either killed or taken captive. And I just want to mention very briefly the one who escaped was, was a man named Efren Roper. And I like him because, um, he, un unfortunately, his wife and daughter were killed during the attack. But he was the only one to escape the Rollinson garrison. In uh, May of that year, he was present at Turner Falls, where there was a great battle you may be familiar with, where 150 Englishmen, mostly teenagers uh, and a few others, uh, attacked a group of uh, Indians massacred uh, over 100 Indians who were sleeping, and then themselves were attacked and uh, nearly annihilated. Well, Efren Roper was there, and he escaped that. Ironically, though, he was back in Lancaster in 1697 when Indians attacked, and this time they got him. They, you know, they, so, you know, uh, he was, I always say that he was at, at the end of his Roper at that time. That's bad. Yeah. That's bad. Okay. Um, he was the only one. So Mary... Um, in this horrific time, she has a vivid description in her book of this attack, and I won't go into it because I don't have time, but she has a graphic description of what was going on. Uh, she saw her uh, young nephew, 12-year-old nephew, being killed. She saw her brother-in-law being killed. Uh, she saw her oldest sister being killed. She herself and her three children were taken captive. Uh, uh, another sister of her and, uh, and a number of her nieces and nephews uh, were, were taken captive law, uh, uh, as well. Uh, and um, unfortunately, during the attack, Mary was holding her young daughter, Sarah, and a musket ball went through Sarah and wounded Mary. Now, Mary wasn't too badly wounded, and she doesn't dwell on her wounds, but Sarah was mortally wounded. She was shot, Mary describes it, through the bowels. Uh, and it took the little girl nine days to die, unfortunately. And you have to realize the conditions that uh, Mary was under. When she writes her book, she divides her chapters into what she calls removes. Remember, she was captive for 11 and a half weeks. And during this time, the Indians, for the most of that time, were fleeing the English because the English had sent soldiers after them, after this attack. So the Indians were on the move. It was February. It was a harsh winter. Uh, they, the Indians themselves had very little food. So Mary describes the first week of her captivity as having very little to eat and having virtually no shelter. She talks about sleeping on the ground in February in uh, this area, really, roughly this area, uh, sleeping on the ground in February. And she's got this little girl that's dying on her hands. And as they tell you, it took a, the little girl nine days to die. It was a horrific experience. Um, and in addition, she was separated from her other two children. 
her son Joseph was about 12 years old and her daughter Mary was about 10. And they went off with other, they were taken with other groups of Indians. Mary was sold to Creopin as his uh, slave and Wiedemo became her mistress, as it were. Uh, we have a lot of, we, we, we learn a lot from Mary Rowlandson's book, not only about Mary, uh, and she showed great fortitude and courage, of course, but also she gives a vivid description of Wiedemo. It's a, it's a great description. Now, she has no love for Wiedemo, obviously, but uh, she described, we know of uh, Wiedemo as a woman from uh, many of the descriptions that Mary gives us in the book. We also know a lot about Indian uh, customs because of uh, Mary's description, especially how Indians survived during uh, uh, this period. I just want to read one passage where she describes um, how the Indians survived. And of course, she was among this. She was also sharing in this food. She was talking about the food that the Indians uh, were gathering at this time while they were fleeing the English. Their chief and commonest food was ground nuts. They also ate nuts and acorns, artichokes, lily roots, ground beans, and several other weed and roots that I know not. They would pick up old bones and cut them in pieces at the joints. And if they were full of worms and maggots, they would scald them over the fire to make the vermin come out, and then boil them and drink up the liquor, and then beat the great ends of them in a mortar and so eat them. And then she goes on to say that they would eat other things too. But this is the kind of food that she was subsisting on. Uh, as I said, she talked about her removes. Each time the Indians moved, she, she called it a, a, a new chapter. There were 21 removes in all told. Uh, and they were constantly fleeing in the winter with very little food. Um, she was exhausted, of course. They ended up in southern Vermont at one point, and then they uh, finally camped out in Wachusett, where the Indians spent uh, that winter, uh, the rest of that winter in, in Wachusett. Uh, so uh, she did manage to survive. She mentions the hardships, and she, but she also mentions um, a lot of kindnesses that the Indians did for her. She mentions, uh, constantly through the book, she's very bitter towards the Indians. Of course, I mean, they, they killed her family, they killed her daughter, they abducted her son and daughter. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her. She's suffering terribly. Uh, so obviously she's bitter towards the Indians. She mentions this. And, and some of them were, were quite cruel to her. Uh, Wiedemo tried to kill her at one point and nearly killed her at one point in a fit of rage. Uh, but she also mentions a numerous acts of kindnesses that total strangers, Indians that were total strangers to her, uh, performed. Some of them who were themselves starving shared food with her. And she mentions this. Uh, many of them would allow her to share their heat at nighttime. Uh, if there was shelter, they would allow her to sleep near the fire. Others wouldn't. Um, you know, one very mean Indian threw ashes in her face and almost blinded her. Uh, so there was meanness, but there was also goodness too, which I find interesting, the fact that she's writing this book, she's bitter against the Indians, but she does take the time to say, you know, talk about the common humanity of some of them. Uh, also during this uh, period, she became acquainted, I won't say friends because she wasn't friends, but she became acquainted with Philip. She had, actually had a number of con conversations with King Philip. So uh, again, we, get, we see a different side of things from this remarkable book that she wrote. Uh, I guess I'm not going to get to the women of Mar Marblehead, right? <laughs> Too bad. It's, always, it's in the book. <laughs> uh, I, 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 it, I'm sure you're all tired and tired of hearing me talk. It's uh, 3.30. So any questions before I wrap up? Yes, two questions. Yes. Do we know what happened to uh, Mary Rollinson's children? Okay, yes. We do know what happened to Mary Rollinson's children. Um, many of her nieces and nephews, we don't know what happened to her. But we do know what happened. Uh, Mary herself was redeemed, uh, ransom, but the term they used was redeemed, for 20 pounds. And she was let loose. Um, it was John Hoare from Concord that went with the 20 pounds and gave it to the Indians, and she was released uh, in Princeton at Redemption Rock. Her son Joseph was redeemed in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for seven pounds. Now, this money was all donated by uh, strangers, and her daughter Mary was released in Providence, Rhode Island. So you can see how scattered they were. The son in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and the daughter was released in uh, Rhode Island, and, and they were united as a family. They moved to Wethersfield, uh, Joseph, the husband, died in 1678. 
Now, we don't know what happened to Mary. There were some historians who say she died in 1678. Uh, there are others who say, oh, no, she died the year her book was published, 1682. There's others that say, oh, no, she lived another 20 years. She remarried. We know who she remarried. So we really don't know with certainty what her, her ultimate fate was, unfortunately, as is the case with so much of that. Did you have a question? Yes. Uh, what were the approximate causes of the war originally? Well, as I said, the, um, there had been friction, had been fomenting for a long time. The English were grasping more and more land, either uh, scrupulously or unscrupulously. But no matter how you looked at it, they were taking the, the land. In fact, uh, Philip uh, gave a famous speech, which I've got in, I think, one of my books. Uh, translated. He couldn't speak English, but it's been, it was translated by a man who knew him well, uh, saying that he was... Uh, he was determined not to live till he had no country. In other words, they were being squeezed in, squeezed in, and squeezed in. And also, also, as I said, the culture was being destroyed. Uh, many Indians were converting to Christianity. Once they converted to Christianity, they no longer owed allegiance to the sachem. So the sachems were losing power. Uh, there were other things, too. Like the, One of the great grievances was that the English cattle were constantly eating the Indians' crops. The Indians didn't put fences up, or they probably couldn't in most cases, and there, the cattle were going in there, the horses, the pigs, the, you know, the sheep, everything, were eating their crops. That was another bone. It wasn't probably the major cause of the war. Also, the English were trying to force their laws on the Indians. We're talking about very strict Puritans at this time with very strict Sabbath laws. I mean, if you read about the punishments that they gave their own people for breaking the Sabbath, there's one soldier who was heavily punished because on Sunday he actually tried to repair his shoes. His boots had holes in them. He tried to repair them. Well, you don't work on the Sabbath. He was punished. Well, Indians themselves were. They weren't allowed to hunt on Sunday. They weren't Christians, but they weren't allowed to hunt on Sunday. They could be punished for hunting on Sunday. Uh, they, they couldn't engage in pastimes on Sunday because the Puritans felt that this was ungodly. Uh, so there were a lot of causes. There were restrictions against the Indians. They weren't allowed to own horses. They weren't allowed to own boats. Uh, because the English didn't want them to have mobility to move around. So they, they just felt themselves being constrained, and uh, they felt that they had no choice. The English, you know, were, were totally surprised by the fact, you know, the, the, every, you, time and time again in King Philip's War, you have a community that's amazed that their Indians rose against them. For example, Springfield was attacked and destroyed by the Agawams. And the people said, oh, the Agawans, we're friendly with them. We've been friendly with them for years. They didn't realize that the animosity that had been building. I mean, that's why you had all of these tribes rising up. The only major tribe that, didn't, that we actually remained neutral, despite numerous provocations by the English, were the, were the um, Pentecooks. The Pentecooks uh, remained neutral, or, even though they were really uh, harassed by the English. They, but they're the only tribe that remained neutral. All the others either sided with the English or rose up against the English. It was a very brutal, very brutal period. Um, I didn't mention the plight of the Christian Indians. I just want to mention that they were treated the way uh, this country treated their Japanese citizens uh, in World War II, uh, even worse, because the Christian Indians were herded onto Deer Island in Boston Harbor, where hundreds of them died from starvation and exposure. Um, okay. Any other questions? Uh, oh, I want to thank everyone for your patience. I didn't put anyone to sleep, I don't think. Usually sometimes there's just someone nodding off there. But I, well, of course, that's why I had my war club with me. They were afraid of that. Right? <laughs> so uh, we were a great audience. Thank you. Uh, you showed some of the fortitude of Mary Rowlandson by <laughs> sticking it out. Thank you. Uh, uh,